everyone. This is the ESOP Guy. Hopefully, I have caught you at a good time of the day as you embark upon this very new ESOP podcast topic. So welcome to the journey to an ESOP and beyond. We are in season five and kicking off with this. The fun group. Welcome to detention. Spencer, Bethany, Fridge, Martha. You're all here for a reason. You know what it is. You should be thinking about who you are and who you want to be. Fortunately, you'll have plenty of time to figure that out while you're cleaning out the basement. That sucks. We're going to figure out who you are and who you want to be. So we're kicking off this episode as Jumanji, and we're going to use this movie to just nail down some of the thoughts around communicating your ESOP. And this is going to be something that we're going to talk about a lot this year because it is something that I'm telling you gets talked about a lot as we talk through um, folks on their own journey to an ESOP. What I wanted to get to in this topic, so just so you're prepared for what you're listening to, is, is some of the higher level topics when it gets down to the idea of energizing or re-energizing your ESOP. So as you as you start listening to this, you may already have an existing ESOP company uh, that you guys have, have pulled the trigger on, or or that hasn't been too recent, or has been maybe maybe it's been several several years, or maybe even more than several years. So the, the idea behind what goes into energizing your ESOP and and re or re-energizing your ESOP as it relates to your employees, and and so the understanding of the communication side is really going to be important, um, and so. Part of what we're going to do today is just go over some higher level concepts behind what employees really need to know and understand as far as the employee stock ownership plan and what they're involved in. And I think some of these are going to be a little more applicable to companies maybe that are brand new to ESOPs or going to be brand new to ESOPs. Um, but at the same time, we might be touching on some other things that maybe more mature ESOP companies have not done in a long while, that might be super helpful for them to do. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, as you listen to the podcast, hopefully it's helpful to you. Share it with a friend if you think it might be um, a benefit to them. Please rate and review the podcast. I, it's super helpful for the audience of people that are tuning in or trying to figure out, hey, I need a good resource for under, better understanding employee stock ownership plans. Please also go to our website at journeytoanesop.com and find all the information on our podcast plus other types of topics and resources that we have available to you to better understand employee stock ownership plans. Okay. If that is that, and that is here, right here, I think. this game. So in the scene, let me just give you the, this is Jumanji 2017. They're out there in the middle of the game and they're trying to learn what they're actually doing. And one of the players is Jack Black, who is, you know, one of the avatars. And so he's like the, the person who has the skill of reading the map. And he realizes um, that they're in danger. And so they start running because of like 15 motorcycles with guns mounted on them kind of jump out of nowhere and they start just chasing them down. So it's pretty, a pretty fun scene. The point is, um, as we, as we connect this into the topic today, what I really like about this movie as it relates is, is that there's this, there's this, uh, awareness as it starts off, like who you are and who you want to be. There's this thing that's this this challenge in in the game that they're kind of thrusted into or forced into in a sense, but it's very, very similar in a sense. Like here comes the employee ownership concept, right? And we're, what we're doing today is we're starting to kind of like peel back this idea and the question, how do my, how do my employees going to understand this? You know, and that one of the things I've learned over the last, you know, say four seasons and doing a lot of different ESOP transactions is that there's there's definitely on people's mind 
the idea behind like how do my employees going how are my employees going to receive this you know one of the one of the goals and objectives as we start isolating goals and objectives with a shareholder comes down to hey I want my employees to benefit from this and I, whether they want that from a return on investment you know as we just think about it from pure business or they really do want to reward their people i mean that's really i would say it's much more the latter they really do want their employees to benefit from the esop and one of the one of the things i always tell people when we're doing some discussions on on this topic or anything really just from a pure management standpoint is just a, is like a human nature aspect what people do not understand or what they do not know they gravitate towards the negative and so one of the things that we as we talk about communicating your esop to your employees is this idea that we need to give them as much information as possible at the at the the most appropriate times and so we'll talk a lot about that, you know, in season five, as we go through like some of the best practices and all that. So, so just keep that in mind. And what I mean by that, just, just high level is that don't tell them anything that you don't really know for sure. Right. So the worst thing you can do is tell somebody something and then it changes and you're like, Oh, I thought it was this, but it's now it's this because what's happening there is that you're going to erode trust with the, with the people. Right. So with whoever your, your employees are communicating. So as we, as we think about this, of course, we're, we're focused in this topic as, you know, from an employee centric position, right? A lot of times when the topics for the ESOP um, podcast have been very shareholder centric or they're in keep manager centric. So this is really just rank and file employee centric as we, as, as we start thinking about it. In where this goes is like one of the things I like about this scene too is it as we go through the movie, it's like it illustrates one of the one of the main things that we all really know deep down is that it does take a team, and that just means that that nobody gets there by themselves, and you you surround yourself in business with really smart people that have different strengths and weaknesses, and you're going to get a way better um, effect or overall um, effectiveness in your organization as you as you blend strengths and weaknesses. And what this movie, as we start kind of like just reducing that down to, this movie you have four key people that have different strengths and weaknesses and they're not all the same people. And you could say, well, I'd rather be the strong guy that can run really fast and punch everybody out. But the guy that can read the map is saving everybody from, you know, near doom because nobody knows this is coming and here come the motorcycles with guns on them. So that's an important element as, as we, as we start thinking about this. And I hope that culturally that's, that's kind of a, where, however you call it in your culture, that is a core value. Like in our firm that I, I shared with you, it takes a team, but hopefully that is a, uh, an element of what you're doing the ESOP for in the first place, because you want to reward the people. And also, you know, as, as we say that we're rewarding teamwork, we're rewarding everybody stepping into their differences in the value that they create for the organization. The idea behind this first part is really to, to kind of take the, uh, uh, maybe again, high level, but then eventually as we start getting into this, there's going to be a lot more, um, specifics to it, but is the transition from an employee to employee owner. And the concept behind that is, is that when you are an employee, your whole career, and you have never actually sat in the seat of ownership, uh, you, you may not have had the experience of understanding. And some people have owned their businesses and they've sold and they've become employees, right? So I just want to be very, very careful to say, you know, this is a very broad stroke um, assessment, but I would say that the, an employee that has only been an employee their whole career has not dealt with some of the things that the owner has dealt with at the levels of say stress, anxiety, risk, you know, those kind of things where they're, you know, the company's gone through a difficult time and the, the owner who's really in charge of everything who has all of their capital and maybe all of their, you know, say 20 years of their time, 30 years of their time invested in this business have a lot of perspective in that. And so what we're wanting to do is transition an employee to employee ownership with the proper perspective. And we're not really looking to try to 
look at them as, Hey, you're now an owner, like the, like the classic example I've just explained. Um, we have the best in a sense, the, the opportunity for the best of both worlds of being an employee with the benefit of, of being able to kind of not have to be so stressed out by the whole operation because it's being shared across this, this whole rank and file of employees of like what's going to happen in the future. But at the same time, the value that can be created on a long-term basis in an employee owned company is really where we're trying to go. And, and when, when you look at that, it's really kind of important to, to try to be able to, to aim at something when you're communicating to your employees. And I think the main thing we're aiming here at is how do I get them to start thinking like employee owners? And I think we have to be very, very important, very careful to define what that means. Because I think as a, as a business owner, I could be very um, focused on my, maybe my, my very small definition of an ownership. Like this is what I think it is. Right. And, but it's not going to be the same as just being a classic owner. So I wanted to make that point. I'm just from the last few days, I just left a ESOP site visit. And so this is a company that's going through the ESOP process and we're, you know, we're going through all the stages of, of developing, you know, and, and getting closer and closer to negotiating their ESOP transaction. So as I was at the site visit and then one of the things the client wanted to do, which I thought was really helpful is to, uh, kick off the committee, the ESOP committee. So what this really is, if you don't know, and it's just, there's no, like, there's no rule of thumb here. There's no like, Oh, you're, you're every company should have an ESOP committee and you should have this person, this person, and this person on the committee. So there's no, uh, you know, unfortunately that some people just want that type of specific advice. Like how do I create the committee? Who should be on it? Um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to kind of lean or always towards this idea that it's going to depend on your organization, like who should be on the committee. The fact is you should have a committee. And in general, the fact is that that committee should not be dominated by the shareholder who sold their stock or shareholders only because you want the committee to step into a place where they're, they're the intermediary between the, what's happening in the company and the employees kind of like it's a very bad example, but kind of like a union rep. Like they're the people that you're are the peers of the employees. And so kind of we were as we go as we went through the site visit, the second part of the agenda was to meet people that were interested in being on the subcommittee. So we're really, really ahead of things in this in this conversation. And I wanted to share a few things that that are just real. Like they had questions that these employees had that I thought were, these are good questions. And, and I'm sharing these because, um, I think the main, the main part of, of what I want to get across today in this podcast is, is I'm guilty of, of thinking I know what the employees are thinking, right? I'm guilty of that idea, but we don't know. And that's why we all have to ask good questions and we have to be inquisitive about or curious about their where they are with the idea that that they haven't been through this whole process like they what happens typically in a you know esap process is we close the transaction and then we start and then we start the conversations with the employees and generally what happens is like just say just for instance the company's esap process took six months Could have taken longer. Some companies, they've been researching it for three years and we finally pulled the trigger and they went through this whole process. So the shareholders and I'd say, you know, a a contingent of of key employees probably have a very good understanding, um, at least way better than, of course, the employees. So the employees are starting at ground zero. Let me try some of that. Mm. Wait, what? What? That's my famous pound cake. Cake? Nothing. You said this was bread. I guess it's been so long I forgot what it tastes like. How do you forget what? What's happening? Is something happening to me? No. Am I am I am I shaking? Uh-uh. Am I breaking out? No. Am I still black? Yes. Okay. Okay, man. We're, we're fine. Everything is fine. Yeah, no, no, no. It's okay. It probably just meant that I love cake. I couldn't resist it. <laughs> hey, it's all good. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, so, so this is a good scene. Honestly, um, the whole movie is good, but he ends up. So, so back up on that a little bit. If you haven't seen the movie, um, what happens is that you have strengths and weaknesses and this particular character, his weakness is cake. And so, um, nobody understands what that means until this scene when he actually mistakes bread for, um, pound cake. And so the idea behind it all is like, he's like, Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. And then he just basically explodes and eventually gets a new, um, you know, life comes back and blah, blah, blah. So, so that's kind of the, the, the cool part about that scene is I start to, to get into this other is to get into the deeper part is like what we interpret in the ESOP as we, as we think about this, again, a perspective that we're going to continue to orient around is, is the perspective of an, of an employee and how they might per, like think about the idea of uh, being in an ESOP company, you know, and I, and I think part of what I was trying to stress before is, is there's, there's, what we have to do is pull ourselves back a little bit as the shareholder that's selling their company to an ESOP because they've had all this background and experience and put yourself in the employee perspective. And so I was giving a little insight into like this meeting that we had this week with a client and they had uh, their own employees that would be the future ESOP committee. And what I'm going to share a little bit is that some of the thoughts they had, questions they had about, um, thoughts that they had. And so just similar to the idea of like, you know, just cake's good, right? Um, in this situation with the movie, obviously that exploded the, the character. And, you know, that obviously isn't, um, things we think are good are not always good, right? So sometimes people think, you know, the employees just going to love this. Like they're just going to love this. But one of the things I will take, I will say overall, and then I'll get into the like, specifics that, that we were experiencing in, in that meeting. Is that the, what, the anxiety that might get created by having an ESOP plan and, and, and what we can do in that regard is, is communicate as much as possible about the reality and the truth and what's actually real about the ESOP plan up to the point to we actually, you know, know the information as we know more and more as we go through the ESOP process and close the transaction. And as we more know more and more, we're able to share, um, more and more of that information so that we can ease the anxiety. But what, what really is good for somebody um, is a matter of making sure they understand it from that perspective. So that's what we're trying to do is give them um, a better perspective on, on those types of things. So one of the things that came up was like, how do I, you know, what, what's the opportunity cost in this situation with an ESOP plan? Like what, what might be helpful for some companies they have and when, we, when we're talking about ESOPs, let's just automatically go to what's the, what are the options under retirement planning you know scenario. So most of the time the company already has an existing 401k plan. And so what what can be done here when we're talking about an ESOP versus a 401k is that you can just kind of contrast, compare and contrast what is a 401k versus what is an ESOP. And many, many times what's happening is the ESOP itself is not replacing the 401k. Um, it could be in lieu of a 401k plan, but it's not going to probably replace um, or in lieu of the match of the 401k, but it's not like they're going to, they're not going to dissolve the 401k plan. So you're going to have this, this combination of like, Hey, I've got this over here on the 401k side, the employee is putting their own money in. And of course the company is matching that in a lot of scenarios on the ESOP side the employee is not putting their own money in and they're getting this benefit that the company is, is basically funding the, the payment and it's being funded through the, the purchase of these shares and the, the shares are going to be put into this ESOP plan. So one of the, one of the questions around that is, is the understanding that that are the thought process behind, Hey, am I, am I becoming an owner? If I have a company that has say 40 people, am I now one fortieth of an owner? And the answer to that question needs to be really clear at the very front end. Like, no, you're not immediately going to have one fortieth of the company. What's going to happen is there's going to be allocations that will be released in stock over this period of time that has to be established in the development of the ESOP plan itself. And I always like to use the, the qualifying adjective. It's a long-term retirement plan. The benefit is there and it's 
there's all these different elements of the benefit itself, but it is a long-term retirement plan. And so the employee needs to understand that that's, that's going to take time for, for that to happen. And part of the rule of thumb here is that I think it, because it's a non-discriminatory retirement plan, it is going to benefit all of the rank and file in the company. And that's going to be really a really good thing. And however, it is going to be taking, it is going to take time. So I would say that um, in general, that will benefit more somebody that's going to be, you know, a younger person in a company, say they, maybe they just started their career and they got, you know, 20, 30 years with that company. That person in the ESOP scenario could potentially have way more value in their plan because it kind of will compound as time goes on. So around that other corner, you know, it's this idea that, you know, what happens for the person that's, that's much older in the, in the rank and file and the roster. And I think you've got to talk through those ideas as well. Um, in your ESOP planning way before you get to the, to the stage where you're ready to roll out this, this idea behind, you know, what your, how your employees are going to experience it and keeping in mind what's in it for them, right? What's in it for them? How are they going to, how are they going to perceive that at an employee level Um, with the goal here, of course, to transition the employee thinking process into an employee ownership thinking process and trying to trying to connect the dots between the two. And I, and I think one of the, the very challenging aspects of all of this is that it is um, it is hard to, you know, when you have a say you have a population of employees that has, you know, everything from, you know, baby boomers to Xers to Z, Y, you know, millennials. So you have this huge spectrum in some cases of of age, you know, differences in ages. And how do you appeal to different audiences in that same population of employees with the same ESOP plan and the same limitations and all the things that that exist with that? Um, another thought or question came out of that discussion about like the risk of you know being in the plan and what does that mean from an employee perspective? Like, how would you even define that from an employee perspective? So I think the first thought process is that. You're as a business owner, you're selling your shares. You're you're not really thinking about um, business, the business risk side, the way maybe an employee might think about it. And so there might be some anxiety related to even understanding um, the full, the forecasted potential ups and downs of the business and how that is going to affect them. So when we talk about risk to the employees. That I would I would have definitely ask like more clarifying questions like what does that really mean to you when you're start when you're starting to think about it now um, there is a there is a risk profile and I think most of this is around like the idea of my 401k has a diversified risk portfolio and I'm I'm as a retirement asset as an employee what I want to do with my investment you know advisor group who manages the 401k plan is I want to, I want to make sure that that I've minimized the risk of something that I know I'm going to need in the future. So diversification is the way you do that. When we think about the risk of being in an ESOP plan, especially when you have the combination of these two things, the 401k and an ESOP plan, we know that the the ESOP plan is going to have a concentrated amount of, um, of the asset being invested in the stock of the company which is really kind of the design of all this. This is the advantage and the disadvantage. The advantage is that a small closely held company stock has the potential to grow significantly faster and more um, and return larger, larger rewards to the employee um, than a diversified 401k plan. So having that, I mean, one of the best things is having both of those together. You get your diversification and you get this other piece. So you have your cake and you eat it too, in a sense, and I think from the risk of the employee standpoint is, is helping to, um, I think this is an opportunity, you know, because one of the, one of the aspects of communicating the ESA is going to be engaging with your people at, at whatever level is appropriate for the company, um, in within this idea of financial literacy. And I think this, this helps to kind of say, Hey, what are the things that we are, how we, how we, how are we doing this in the future? Like what were some of the things that went into the planning and the development of the ESOP? And so part of that question could be answered. And Hey, if I'm thinking about the risk of the future of the, of the company, as it affects me directly as an employee. Now, 
even though I haven't paid for the, any of the, uh, the stock, right? It's been given to me in this ESOP plan. It's still going to be, you know, in me, in my mind, a, um, a rational thought process for the employee to think about the future. And I think it's really good. And it does set us up to talk about the, you know, their, their knowledge of understanding of the value, how the value of the business goes. But I think going backwards a step and talking about the way that the plan was created with the advisor, and hopefully the advisor did this, which is basically um, working through the modeling to determine the sustainable structure of the ESOP, which includes the valuation, it includes the debt structure, it includes the tax benefits of the company. And be, by all of those, there should be some kind of stress test to the cash flow. That's something I would share, not in, in specific nature, I wouldn't share all the modeling, but I would share that the idea is that the company has has conservatively worked through a process to get to where they are now that helps to mitigate the risk of, of the future of the company being in jeopardy or having some major issue. Strength, karate, tai chi, aikido, dance fighting. Dance fighting? Is it even a thing? Weakness, venom. Seriously, paleontology, what does that even mean? Um, study of fossils, I think. That's kind of cool. Says the gorgeous karate badass to the old fossil guy who doesn't have any endurance. I hate this guy. Weakness? Cake. Yes, cake is my weakness. Along with speed and strength. Huh. Strength is my weakness. Hey, can I, quick question. How is strength my weakness? Somebody explain that to me. And why would I need speed? Why would I need to be fast when I'm being chased by an enormous killer zebra? Or so, so this whole this whole scene is all about the idea behind strengths and weaknesses, and they finally they discover like you know that they're in this video game and all that. So we're kind of back and forth a little bit. Um, what I wanted to talk about in this part of it was just the idea that you have you have strengths and weaknesses, of course, within the team that we talked about, and when you think about the strengths and weaknesses. Um, of the ESOP. What we're getting to is how do you explain this from an employee perspective? And, you know, one of the things is, is the strengths and weaknesses of just the ESOP itself. I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about how the employee will perceive the ESOP being uh, a strength to them and maybe a weakness. And, and I think that's a good place to start. Um, one of the things that I think is important in the strategy of communicating to your employees is how you go about explaining the <clears throat> the way everything it kind of works from a from a financial literacy standpoint. So we touched on that a little bit earlier, and there's there's really going to be a lot more to talk about to explain this. But on a very high level basis, I think one of the things that your employees need to understand what is an ESOP, you know, pros and cons. Like what is it? What is the strengths of it? What are the, what are the weaknesses of it? So that that you're not going into this in the stage of, of say that you're in the stage of, of going through the ESOP process and you're like super excited and you want to tell your employees what I would, what I would caution you to do is be careful not to oversell the ESOP and really anticipate the strengths and weaknesses and be able to explain, you know, what it is and what it's not. And so I've kind of dealt with that a little bit in terms of explaining this as a long-term benefit and how that works relative to how they're going to get their shares and how it really comes back to being a valuable tool for people that are going to be in the company for a longer period of time. So I think that's going to be important to, to understand that. Now, as we, as we dial into some of these strengths, uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm just giving you the idea behind um, an employee perspective. I think one of the things that they're going to want to understand is, is the value, the potential value of this to them over that period of time, over some longer period of time. That is going to correlate with the idea of the future value of the company. And if the value of the company um, has every value of, of the businesses itself, as you start thinking about business valuation, have drivers of value. So I think what's going to happen when we connect that to financial literacy is you're going to want to make this connection to help your, your employees understand this is kind of basic business education. And one of the things about financial literacy is going to be just general, generally speaking. So if you had like this, um, 
in your mind as you think about this, like a, a, an executive MBA class for your key people or for your for for your employees that kind of explain how the just say income statement works and the balance sheet works and what is revenue and, and gross margin and net income and how does that translate to cash flow. What is the balance sheet, the working capital, the accumulation of cash? How does debt affect all of that as well? And so you're starting to kind of build what I'd say is a foundation of understanding in the business as far as these financial literacy concepts go. Assuming, um, you know, there's probably people that have a lot of, of basic understanding already, depending on your your employee roster of who's there. And then assuming that there might be some people that have completely no idea what we're talking about when we start talking about these things. Now, so I would say that building the strengths and weaknesses around the ESOP, what we have to do is lay the groundwork for financial literacy so that they can understand the other things when we start talking about the real strengths of the ESOP, which I'm going to kind of say, you know, in a very reduced level, like and we, I could go into this for a lot of, in a lot of different directions, but primarily, um, I would say this to people for ESOPs in general, but this idea that wealth is created in this country by comp, by individuals starting up a company and building wealth over a period of time by the business, the value of the business and the profit of that business growing. That's where wealth is created. It's, it's generally not created in somebody having this wonderful investment strategy. Um, that they made a bunch of money, but then they lost a bunch of money. That's not usually what happens. It's usually in our country, it's usually some people, you know, re- realizing the value of having a small business. And the reason that is the creation of wealth is because small business stock can accumulate in value much faster than a very large portfolio or large cap stocks that, that you might invest in. So you get the opportunity to get as an ESOP employee or an employee owned company, you get the opportunity to participate by being given these shares that have the potential to grow in values. So with all that, we're going to build on this idea for the ESOP communication episode. So this is kind of like a big start for us and to just kind of talk through some of those. There's so much more we need to talk about. And we're going to invite people to do that with us. So it's going to be a very interesting part of, like I would say, season five. And a lot of the theme here is to push towards some of the major questions that get asked about how do I communicate this to my to my employees and what what should I say and how should I say it and when should I say it? So, so be looking for that. Thank you guys for joining today and we appreciate it. Go to our website if you have any questions at journeytoanesop.com. If you can share this, this uh, podcast with somebody that you know might be helpful for them if they're thinking about doing an ESOP. Um, please rate and review the podcast if you're technically able to. If you're not, then you're forgiven. So have a great day. We'll see you on our next step on this journey to Nissan.